Good morning. Blessed be the name of the Lord our God, the maker of heaven and earth, who calls his people all across this world from every nation, tribe, and tongue to worship him today. And we get to be part of that. This is wonderful. We welcome you in person. We welcome you on WZOE. We welcome you on YouTube, everyone who's joining us in one way or another. May the Lord be with each of you. And as we worship him, uh, those in person, thank you for being here. And we ask that you just wear a mask when you're entering and exiting. And during times of singing or response, uh, that would be helpful to us. And then following the service, our ushers will release you and uh, out, out the back exit. And feel free to hang out and chat with each other if you want out in the beautiful sunshine. Let's take advantage of that as long as we can. And as we worship, let's be mindful of things that are happening in the church. First of all, the Grief Share Ministry will be meeting. This is a wonderful Christ-centered support group for those who have lost loved ones, uh, just helping people process grief, which is a, a journey like no other. And we invite you, if, if you really need to uh, journey through grief with others who care and will walk with you, this will be starting Tuesday, October 6th from 6 to 8 in our fellowship hall. And uh, feel free to contact us if you need more information um, about that. Also, we were not able to offer a membership class when we normally would, but for, for any of you who are listening uh, who would be interested in exploring formal membership, what it means to take another step toward belonging to, in this congregation and taking ownership. We're a congregational church and the membership does uh, make decisions on a number of things. If you are interested, please let us know. And if we have uh, a few folks who would like to do that, we will find a way to offer that class to people. Um, our senior high youth group is kicking off tonight uh, at 6.30. We'll be meeting over at the youth house. And for, during the warm weather, we want to stay outside as much as we can. Uh, but feel free, high schoolers, to come. Invite someone. I think that one of the gifts of this pandemic season is that because so many other things are canceled and so many routines are disrupted, people may be open to doing something different. So uh, young people, I encourage you to reach out, invite a friend uh, to come and participate in this together. Uh, you know, this week as I was preparing for this service and just thinking about the loss and the difficulties that so many people are facing, probably people listening are in quarantine right now, and um, my mind was drawn to Habakkuk, and I'd like for us to... Um, speak a call to worship to one another from Habakkuk, a prophet of God who lived during very difficult times. And um, the Bible provides words for us when we're in the midst of challenges as well. So in your bulletin or on our screen, we, screen will you join uh, in responding with me? In the midst of troubled times, let us join in the prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. Lord, we have heard of your fame we stand in awe of your deeds, O Lord. Renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. In wrath, remember mercy. God came from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His glory covered the heavens and his praise filled the earth. His splendor was like the sunrise. Rays flashed from his hand where his, where his power, power was, was hidden. hidden. Plague went before him, pestilence followed his steps. He, he stood, stood and, and shook, shook the earth. He looked and, and made the nations, nations tremble. The ancient mountains crumbled and the age old hills collapsed. His ways are eternal. O oh Lord, Lord, have mercy on us. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. I believe that God is on the move and the one who has shaken the heavens and who has shaken the earth in the past is shaking everything up in big ways and in little ways. And may the shaking of our world produce in us a hunger and a thirst to know the ways of God and to draw deeper into trust in his sovereign purposes. We're going to sing a new song today for our church that 
invites us to rest in God's sovereignty, in his rule, in his kingship, in his being over all of history and one who can be trusted even in difficult times. So what I'd like to do is just sing a line or two and then invite you to sing it with me. Uh, and we'll, we'll teach you a little bit of it and then we'll just dive in together to the whole thing. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. Let's sing that together. There is strength within the sorrow. Let's sing it. And you meet us in our morning with a love that casts out fear. Okay, and we're going to go ahead to the chorus. It goes like this. Your plans are still to prosper. You've not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the blood. Let's sing your plan. Still to prosper, you've not forgotten us with the sin, the fire, and the flood. Faithful forever, perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. Faithful forever.
And Lord, we praise you today that uh, in the midst of trying times, we are not without hope. We are not without comfort because of the precious promises of your word that teach us that even in the midst of what the enemy would bring uh, do for evil, you have intended and will use for good, not just in our lives, but in this entire world that is reeling and confused and hurting. And Lord, we pray now for the living hope of Jesus to be real and active in the lives of people. In this building today, listening over the airwaves today, around the world as your church gathers, may you be a living and active hope in our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God for the hope that he brings to us. And we're grateful for uh, his work among us that helps us as a church continue to move forward in mission. We want to keep being a blessing to our world and community. We're uh, receiving donations this, this month for people who want to bless cent our central conference camps, Covenant Harbor, Covenant Point Bible camps. They've been a big part of our church and lives. They're hurting financially, so if you want to designate money for them, we're collecting money throughout the month to just be a blessing to them. Um, we have a couple ways to bless our community. This Tuesday at Monocles, uh, sponsored by Princeton Rotary Club, uh, anything that is purchased all day at Monocles, a significant percentage will go to fund scholarships for Princeton High School. So Tuesday's a great day to go out to eat. We have little um, papers here on your way out that, that you can take and show them uh, you want this to be designated to uh, high school scholarships. The Bureau County Senior Center is also in need of drivers. If you have time during the day, uh, uh, throughout the week, they need some people to help deliver food. Um, meals are put at the door. It's a no-contact delivery. It usually takes about an hour. What a great opportunity to love our neighbors. Friends, we are just looking for ways to be loving our neighbors uh, during this time and loving each other. Um, I also want to just uh, acknowledge um, the last Sunday in August, we, uh, as a congregation, uh, voted to call Jessica as a pastor of faith formation to expand her role from children's ministry to kind of looking at the whole picture of how we make disciples and form people in their faith in this church, both children and also adults. And uh, we, we had prayer for her in the first service. I'd like to pray again. I neglected to do that in the weeks right after the Evo, but we just want to pray a prayer of blessing upon you if you would just come and stand. And uh, I'm going to invite people, will you just stretch your hands forward and pray for God's blessing on Jessica? Dear Lord, we praise you that you do uh, have a purpose and a plan for us in this church and that you desire to form us into the image of your son. And we're thankful uh, that Jessica has heard your call and that the church has also called her as pastor in this area. And we praise you uh, for that opportunity for all of us to grow together, but we especially ask for your blessing upon her, uh, that you will equip her and fill her with your spirit for this task that you will sustain her uh, as she looks at uh, ways to help all of us grow, but during a particularly challenging time, surround her with your grace and remind her daily of your call upon her life. And we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the ways that we are seeking to grow together is um, through reading scripture together. So if you have not joined us and you're interested, um, it's never too late to jump into our reading scripture together program. We have printed schedules um, as you're leaving on the desk in the hallway and also available online um, on our website if you look for reading scripture together. Um, we even have a group and on Facebook that allows us to discuss what we're reading together, to post questions or things we're enjoying. So it's one more way that we can uh, grow together uh, even while separated sometimes. Short readings in the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the book of Psalms each day. So I would encourage you to join us there. I also wanted to say, particularly for those who are joining us remotely, if you are uh, spending time with other people, not if you are not, but if there are close family or friends that you are spending some time with, we would encourage you next Sunday when we celebrate the Lord's Supper 
to consider worshiping with someone else in your home. Again, if this is someone you're already spending time with, we would encourage you to consider saying, join me, let's worship together, let's celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Uh, just an invitation for you to consider. But now I'd like to speak specifically to the kids who are here. And up here I have two pots of dirt today. I have one uh, pot that has been sitting in our garage for a while with dirt that's just gotten hard and packed down. And these rocks were in there too, actually. So it's some nice, hard, old, dried out dirt. And then I also have up here another pot. And I poured some fresh, soft potting soil into it just yesterday. So I'm going to put some seeds in both of them. And the question I have for you is, which one do you think will grow better? The one that's hard and that I gotta put, push the rocks out of the way before I put the seeds in? Or the one that's softer and has the nice fresh dirt? What do you think? What do you think, Sammy? The soft one? I think you're right. I think it's the soft one. Yeah. And did you know that in the Bible, I'll leave these out for a minute actually. Did you know that in the Bible God says that our hearts can be a little bit like this dirt? There are lots of places in the Bible where God says that we can have hard hearts. Can you make a fist with me? Like a hard fist, yeah. Or we can have soft hearts. Okay, you want to open your hand? Yeah. So I'm going to read one of those places to you where God talks about this. This is in Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. This is what the Lord says to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Plow up the hard ground of your hearts. Do not waste your good seed among thorns. O people of Judah and Jerusalem... You who live in Jerusalem, obey me. Do not let your hearts be stubborn. So God says that our hearts, not the one that pumps our blood in our bodies, but the heart that we, we use to choose who we're going to listen to and who we're going to obey and love, that heart can get hard like dirt. And when our hearts are hard, we might hear what God says. We don't want to do it. We want to do what we want. When our hearts are soft, though, we are listening to God and obeying him. And when we have soft, obedient hearts toward God, then our hearts will grow good things, just like this soft dirt has a better chance of growing something good. Our hearts will grow peace and joy and patience and all the fruit of the Spirit. Now, if you got a worship bag today, in that you have piece of paper that looks like this with two hearts on it and it says Jesus please give me a soft heart of love because the only way that our hearts go from being hard to being soft is when God softens them and helps us to say yes so if you want to during the service feel free to color this and decorate it and when you take it home you can cut it out and in your worship bag you should have some cotton balls and you can stuff those into the heart as a soft, squishy little reminder that this is the kind of heart we want God to give us, one that is soft and obedient toward him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. You know that all of us, no matter what age we are, can get hard hearts that want to do things our way. Sometimes because we're afraid to trust you. Thank you that you come by the Holy Spirit with your love and gentleness and you help us if we will say yes to open our hearts to be soft to you so that you can grow good things in us. I pray you would help these children to learn to trust you in new ways with soft hearts and that you would help us who are older to see their example and return to our trusting ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Old Testament lesson can be found in Exodus chapter 4, 
verses 19 through 31. Moses has been standing in dialogue with God at the burning bush for a long time. Now it is time to move in obedience. So let us listen as Moses begins to take steps of obedience to God that will lead him back to Egypt. Exodus 4, 19 through 31. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. The Lord said to Moses, when you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said, bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the desert to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the miraculous signs he had commanded him to perform. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshiped. Our New Testament lesson is found in John chapter 15, verses 14 through 17. Just as Moses helped the Israelite slaves to gain a new identity in Yahweh, so his son Jesus now invites all of us into a new identity as his friends and partners in God's purposes. John 15, 14 through 17. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. The word of the Lord. We're invited into friendship with God and to rest in him. So let's uh, remind ourselves of that with the hymn, Be Still My Soul. <clears throat>
Thanks be to God for the privilege of being on pilgrimage together and with him. Would you just turn around and greet someone with a wave or a smile and just say, hey, I see you. <laughs> I know you're here. God is with us. And we sure thank you for your generosity. We have an offering plate uh, here as you exit if you wish. Uh, or you can go online, eccprinceton.org. We have online giving and an app called Tithely that'll uh, get you uh, giving online if you wish, but we are very grateful for your generosity. Now may the Lord guide us as we enter into his word and, and seek to learn from him. Um, we're continuing our journey through Exodus in the passage that George read earlier from Exodus chapter 4, 19 through 31. And, uh, you know, as I read this passage, this thought occurred to me. Sometimes you can't figure out what you're doing until you just start to do it. Sometimes you can't figure out what you're doing until you just start to do it. I have certainly noticed this to be true of home improvement projects. You make a plan, you lay out the project, you get all the supplies, you try to anticipate all the things you'll encounter, but you just got to dive in at some point. And as you dive in, you realize you had no idea what you were doing and that there's all kinds of other stuff that you're going to have to deal with, including the original problem. But you'd never realize that until you just dive in and get started. You'd never find out how to face the challenge if you don't first take a few steps. This is true of Moses in this passage that we read. Uh, you know, prior to this, for the last several weeks, we've looked at, at Moses' conversation with God at the burning bush where, where God revealed himself and revealed his name to Moses, Yahweh. And, and he invited Moses to be part of the mission of God. And, and, and he answered Moses' objections. And, and now it's time for Moses to just get moving. And I suspect that like a lot of us, he would have appreciated more information, more detail, but that simply is not how God works anywhere. He invites us to trust him by taking the first step or two and to trust that he will reveal the rest as we get moving in obedience. Now, I wonder if any of you are struggling today uh, to get moving in some area. Is there a decision that you need to make? Is there a tough conversation that you need to have with someone? Are you feeling nudged by the Holy Spirit to do something or move in a certain direction? You feel God calling. It, it may just be time to take the next step and trust that God will keep showing you as you keep moving in his direction. Now, this passage is kind of a tricky one, the one that George read. It's a transitional passage in the book of Exodus. It includes several short terse 
narratives that are all lumped together that summarize Moses' very long journey from Midian, where he had been living with his wife and her family for, for decades. And now he has the long journey back to Egypt. And he's going to stop here along the way uh, at Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb, known by two different names. And uh, we would love more details about this long journey, but all we have is this is this chap this section of verses with these um, highlighted segments that don't give us all the details, but that just showcase what the author Moses thinks is most important. What we find is that as Moses travels, he learns a lot more about what his mission is going to involve. So let's walk with him, shall we? First thing I noticed is that. Uh, in this passage, Moses is willing to disrupt his life in order to obey God. Moses is willing to disrupt his life in order to follow the directions God has given him. We're told, uh, the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. So here God is reiterating uh, commands that he gave earlier to Moses to go back to Egypt. I'm sending you to Pharaoh. But what I love about this is that God also considers Moses' needs. He's concerned about his very uh, real uh, questions about safety. Because when Moses left Egypt, he was a wanted man, was he not? Uh, Pharaoh wanted to kill him because Moses had stepped out to try to free a slave by killing an Egyptian slave master. So he was wanted. And God comforts Moses in the midst of calling him into a new task. He says, the men who wanted to kill you are dead. So let's get on with it. I'm calling you to do something, but I'm still concerned about your situation. Uh, a new pharaoh is in power. You're not going to immediately be killed on entry into Egypt. And I think this is a reminder that God is concerned with each one of us. He knows our situation. He knows our limitations. He knows our fears. He knows our personal concerns. And when he asks us to do something, he always takes those into consideration. And because of this, as Moses is learning to trust God... Uh, he is willing to commit his whole life, even his family, in obedience to God. So he calls for Zipporah. Hey, honey, let's get the tents packed up. Let's get the donkey saddled up. Let's get the kids' gear together. It's time to go on a journey. This is not an easy journey to invite your family on to. It's going to require the whole family to relearn the ways of God because Moses and many of his people had forgotten. Zipporah, a wife from another ethnicity, had never known the commands of God. And on the way, we have this kind of strange passage that is very difficult to translate and commentators have argued about it for centuries. But the basic point is that they had forgotten about the sign of circumcision and the importance that that was to Abraham and his descendants as something God asked of them to indicate that they belong to him. And Moses gets into deep trouble for forgetting and neglecting this in his family. And his wife Zipporah's obedience saves the day. But all of this is to show that it is going to require Moses' whole family to make adjustments as they follow God. You know, I think this is true throughout Scripture. God rarely just calls an individual. Even when he does call specific people as leaders, it impacts their families, and they have to be willing to help their families on the call of God. Many people in our nation would like to have a form of Christianity, but not one that impacts their close relationships, that informs how they approach marriage and the raising of family that asks them to reorder every priority in their life so that they and their family together can embark on the call of God. But Moses shows here that he's willing to do that. His, his obedience is strongly highlighted. He took the staff of God 
in his hand, just as God had asked him. What's interesting is in prior scriptures, this is called the staff of Moses. Here it's called the staff of God. It used to be Moses' staff for his work. Now it's God's staff for his purposes. This used to be Moses' life for his own agenda. But now his life is at God's disposal for God's purposes. Moses is willing to allow the call of God to disrupt all of life in order to obey God. Are we? Moses is taking a few more steps on his journey, so let's keep on walking with him. The next thing that I see is that uh, Moses learns that he will be in the midst of a cosmic battle between God and the forces of evil in this world. Moses is entering into absolute spiritual warfare. Verse 21 tells us that the Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son, and I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. Moses knew his job was going to be tough, and now here he finds it's going to be tougher than he thought. Moses finds out in the desert that not only did God show him miraculous signs to give to his own people to convince them that God was with them, but now he finds out that not only is he to speak to Pharaoh, he is to show these miraculous signs in the very throne room of Egypt. Moses is going to speak truth to power, but he's also going to show the power of God to the most powerful ruler in the most powerful kingdom in the world. Can you even imagine a call like this? What will be the result of this cosmic conflict between heaven and the powers of evil in this world? And we find out that God says, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh so that he will not let the people go. This is mysterious. This is confusing. It seems unfair. What is going on here? I think there are two things in play when God says he will harden Pharaoh's heart. First of all, Pharaoh's heart is already hard toward the things of God. We've heard that earlier in Exodus, that it's going to take a mighty hand to deliver them from Pharaoh's hand. Pharaoh's heart is already set against God. I've found in life that people who have power don't let go of it easily, even when God asks them to. He holds to power. He is opposed to God. He sees himself as a little mini-God. And so his heart is hard, but something is going to happen to Pharaoh. And we'll see it throughout the book of Exodus, that there are times when Moses speaks to him, and the text tells us Pharaoh hardened his heart and said no, but then throughout the remainder of the time that Moses speaks to him, God hardens his heart, just as he says here he's going to do. There is a biblical principle that is happening in the life of Pharaoh, where one of the ways that, God's bring, that God brings judgment against people is by letting them have their way. One of the ways that God brings judgment is when we say no to God. No, 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 no. I'm going to do my own thing. He allows us to be given over to even harder and harder and harder hearts. Where one decision and two decisions and three decisions that take us further and further from God can lead us to a place where eventually he says, fine, you do it your way. And we take ourselves to a point of almost no return to the word of God and the gracious God that calls us. You can see this throughout scripture that there can be a sort of giving over to our own will. And that is exactly what is going to happen to Pharaoh. And the simple point is this. When we resist God's voice, it becomes even harder to hear. I will never forget when I did ministry in Gloucester, Massachusetts, this young couple who came to the church from a neighboring town, and I just watched them during the service. They listened intently. They were, 
they were just clearly taking everything in, the, the singing, the, the, the sermons. And they spoke to me after the service and said, uh, Pastor Derek, we, we feel like everything that's being said is just for us. Like every sermon, like, like, like it's designed for us. And it was clear to me that the Holy Spirit was speaking to them. We, said, we didn't even know them. How could we design our sermons for them? This was God speaking and calling and drawing. And I was so excited for them. And my excitement turned to deep sorrow because after several Sundays of coming and just feeling drawn to God, they just sort of disappeared. And we never saw them again. And I often wondered what happened to them. And I've seen this happen time and time again in the church where people come and they hear the word of God and they sense it's for them that God is drawing and that God is calling. And at first they seem receptive, but then the cares of the world, as Jesus talks about, or other priorities, whatever it is, enters in and they just sort of go their own way. That is such a dangerous place to be. And I know the grace of God calls and continues to call. But whenever we take a step away from God, it's harder to get back. There's a lot more pride that has to be conquered. There's a lot more that has to be overcome for us to reopen our hearts again. And so I encourage you today, don't be like Pharaoh. When God calls Let's listen the first time and keep moving toward him and not away further and further until our hearts are so hard that we cannot hear. The other reason that God would harden this man's heart is to show that Pharaoh, who literally thought of himself as a sort of living God, Pharaoh was going to become a pawn in the midst of God's purposes. Pharaoh, who thought he was in control and was doing his best to hang on to power and might, little did he realize that God was working in his own heart and directing everything for his purposes so that God could win a great victory over this evil man and his evil empire in God's time and in God's way. Why? Because Egypt had messed with God's son. Here we see for the first time that God refers to the people of Israel as a whole as his firstborn son. Moses, say to Pharaoh, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go so he may worship me. We see the Christian doctrine of election and adoption, this, this theme throughout Scripture that God chooses and has a people for himself and calls people to belong to him. And when God chooses and calls, that call is powerful. See, God had chosen Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and the, the people of Israel, not because they were so great, but because God simply wanted to show his greatness through them. And he called them and he loved them, and here he calls them collectively my firstborn son. This means they have pride of place. They have a future that I'm giving them. Particularly, this means there's inheritance coming their way. In ancient world, the firstborn son got twice the inheritance of everybody else. Now, that doesn't seem fair to us today. That's just how they did it in those days. And when God uses this image, he's saying, this child of mine, Israel, has a great inheritance. They have hope, they have a future, and Pharaoh has messed with that. And it is not going to go well with him because he has put in bondage my child. So Moses finds himself in the midst of this cosmic battle, and, and it made me uh, just reflect that, that, that we're still in a battle, church. There is still a battle being waged between God and the forces of heaven and all sorts of evil in this world. And we know that Jesus came and won a great victory in his death and resurrection. 
But we also understand that the book of Ephesians tells us that battle is still going on as we begin to represent Christ in the midst of it until the day when he comes again and makes everything right. And so while we're in the midst of the battle, here are three things that I take away from this section in Exodus. One, make a choice for God. For heaven's sake, when you hear him call, don't resist. Because by resisting and stepping away, we're actually stepping not just away from God, but onto the side of those who oppose him. And we may never get back. Understand that we belong to God, that in this battle we are, we are not without weapons, that we belong to God because he has chosen us, as the book of John says. You have not chosen me, I have chosen you, says Jesus, and appointed you that you would remain and bear much fruit. The power of God's grace that calls and makes us part of his family will give us the strength we need to fight the weapons of this world that are against God and his purposes. The Bible says that we have access by the Spirit of God to, fa to God as our very Father, our adoptive Father, with all kinds of rights and privileges and a future and an inheritance. So let's stand in that and rest in it. And finally, let God give you your identity and no one else Pharaoh wanted to define reality for the people of Israel. There are all sorts of false narratives and evil voices in our world that would like to give you and your family a different identity. You're just a consumer. You're just someone who works. You're just someone who does your daily tasks. But God wants to give us an identity as his people. So let's step into the battle today and hear his call. The third thing that I see as Moses takes another step and keeps moving forward and as we keep walking with him is that Moses' obedience is going to set others free to find their true identity. Moses is going to help people who have lived a lie that they're nothing more than slaves in Pharaoh's machine to be set free for what God has for them. Moses continues, and lo and behold, he meets Aaron at the mountain of God place of the burning bush. Aaron has also heard from God and has come out to meet him. And together, these brothers, one an insider to the slaves in Egypt and one an outsider, are going to work together to do God's will. Together, they return to Egypt. They keep on walking in obedience. And we're told that they bring together all the elders of Israelites, and Aaron tells them everything the Lord has said to Moses. Can you imagine how depressing the leadership meetings of the elders of Israel had to be before this time? Okay, what's on our agenda tonight? Well, is there anything we can do to protect our people from abuse? Uh, is, there, is there any way we can negotiate with the Egyptians to make their burdens of work less awful? Is there anything we can do to keep our kids, our children, from being killed by them? But at this leadership meeting, for the first time, they listen in awe to the story of a God who has shown up at a mountain in the wilderness. They hear maybe for the first time the name of Yahweh, who has come down to help them. And they have been nothings. They have been cogs in an imperial machine. They have been no better than beasts of burden, subhuman. But God has seen, God has heard, and God has sent these men to speak his words and show these miraculous signs that he has given them. And in response, I love this part, they believed, they bowed down, and they worshiped. To worship, to believe, to bow down is to say, yes, we trust you. We believe that you're going to work. You know what struck me about this moment is that nothing had changed in their circumstances. And still they believed and bowed down and trusted even though all hell was still breaking loose around them, they sensed that God had interrupted, that God had broken into human history with a promise of a good future. So they got on their knees and worshiped him. 
The funny thing is, and we can't really see it in the English translations, but the Hebrew word for serve is often the same word used for worship. And when they were forced to serve Pharaoh, in a way he was setting himself up as the God over them, the one who would rule them and make decisions for them and tell them who they were. Only this was an oppressive God. And what Moses conveys to these people is that they have an identity known only to the one true God. And that his agenda is to deliver them from the wrong kind of service and worship to the right kind of service and worship, where they will be led, freed from the powers of evil and brought to a place where they can serve and know the true God who is a compassionate God who will guide their lives, who will bless their lives, who will make their, their work a blessing and not a curse. God has an identity for his people that they never even dreamed of when they were just cogs in the Egyptian machine. And even though the circumstances around hadn't changed, they began to live into the new reality of their identity as servants and worshipers of the living God. Friends, we are in the midst of some painful realities right now. Our world is turned upside down. There's not a week that goes by that I don't hear some story of how the pandemic and its repercussions are wreaking havoc in people's lives. Everything has been affected. We're in the midst of a nation that, that is divided and plagued with toxic politics. We daily learn about the plight of African Americans subject to unfair practices in many, many different ways. We have our own personal struggles and family issues. But in the midst of this, we have a different identity than ones of fear, anger, hostility. We have an identity that God is giving us as his servants, as his worshipers. And as we begin to worship and devote ourselves and recommit our lives to him and focus upon God and his promises and his blessings, we will feel freedom and a sense that we can move and live and breathe and feel the liberation that comes with walking with God right in the midst of the mess all around us. We are called to begin living into who God says we are not who Pharaoh or anybody else says we are. So today I'm asking you, as we keep walking, like Moses did, not entirely sure where he was going, as we keep walking, let's also begin worshiping and live into this identity that's been given to us by God through Jesus Christ. Let's keep on walking like Moses did. Let's pray. I want you to take a moment to just lift up whatever is most on your heart to God right now. Lift it up before him. Hear us, Lord. Hear our hearts. Hear our concerns. Lord, where we have been reluctant to say yes to you, may we say yes May we follow, may we take a next step, may we not harden our hearts to the voice of the Lord. Hear us, O oh God. Lord, we pray for the people around us, many of whom are absolutely lost, living a life, maybe even what passes as a good life, but underneath there is simply no awareness of you and of their true purpose in you. We pray that they might come to know Jesus that they might come to know their own adoption and sonship and daughtership in the family of God and find purpose. Lord, I pray that you would use us to be a blessing all around us in this community. Lord, open our eyes to see the needs of people and to go out of our way to love those whom you put into our path. Lord, we pray for the nations of the world, for Belarus, and Russia, and Ukraine, and Moldavia, nations full of people that you love, but that have been so battered and broken and bruised by despots and dictators. Oh, Lord, help them to find the hope of the future that comes with knowing you. 
We pray for our nation and the unrest and the injustice and the dysfunction. I pray, O oh God, for your will to be done in the middle of it and for us to be agents of light and truth and not partisan warriors in this election time, but people who cling to our identity in Christ above all else. And may we show the way as those who can love our neighbors no matter what their political stripe. And that we can love our enemies or those whom we think are our enemies. And be obedient to you more than to anybody else. We pray for our local law enforcement, our policemen, our fire department, our first responders, our EMTs. Oh God, work and bless these who work so hard for our community. May they know that they are not alone in their work. May they invite Christ to walk with them. May they be kept safe from all harm. And may they do their job with wisdom and patience and compassion and justice. Lord, we praise you that you're at work in this community. We pray for those who are struggling with COVID-19 that they will find healing, uh, that uh, you would continue to uh, help us through this challenging time in our community and around our country. We, we pray for Joan Ward recovering from a, a surgery and facing challenges today. We, we pray for Pastor Alex and Stacy and Truly and Oliver as they journey here uh, this next week. Watch over and bless them, we ask. And we praise you and pray all of these things together in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I want to sing a song of hope. Truly one of my favorite songs of all time. I cannot tell. And let us take hope as we worship that we have an identity not defined by the chaos and problems of this world.
This is our inheritance, the rule and the reign of God in Jesus Christ. So take this as your identity. Be free from anything else. And let's keep on walking where God is with us. Amen.